and we're live. Morning thoughts, morning thoughts, morning thoughts. Shout out to the people going out to work this morning. Shout out to the people coming in from work this morning. Extra special big up shout out to Seymour for being the first one here this morning. June O'Brien and the DMAC Grand Rising family. Shout out to every single clean hearted, good hearted person who wants good for others as much as you want good for yourself. Shout out to the people going out to work and those coming in from work. Big up and extra special manners and respect to the people who are working two jobs and three jobs and these things. It's rough out there and it's extra rough for some people, but you're making it, right? Give thanks. Health and strength, give thanks. We're here this morning. Mm. Had to take a sip of my tea. Pardon my lateness. I have some lemon in the cup. I'm doing a transparent cup this morning. Just squeeze a fresh lemon in there or a lime and some warm water and that's it, right? I start the day off like that, trying to alkalize the system and get going. All right, health is wealth, right? All right. Big up to Ken Myrie. Shout out Ken Myrie. Ken Myrie linked me up. Ken Myrie is a... um. Staff Sergeant Ken Myrie. Ken Myrie is a U.S. Army soldier as well. And I'm giving him his big up this morning. So that's just that. Big up to Ken Myrie. And thank you, Bridgen, for reaching out, right? Welcome home and all these things that veterans and others say to each other. Others might not be able to or might not know the meaning of that, but you do. Funny story real quick. I was walking in the grocery store the other day with my kids, right? And I said, I said, this man right here is a vet. And I could tell. And my kids were like, how do you know that? Because it's an older man, you know, all grayed up and everything. I know what nine to the five and six to the rear looks like. And it's never going to leave you. It's <laughs> You're going to walk like that for the rest of your life. And it's never going to leave you because it's that um, some people say the brainwashing was that good. Whatever you want to call it. It is what it is. So I walked behind him and I told my kids, I said, watch this. I said, live, 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 all right. And he actually did a kick step, which is a step that you do to get in step. And he started going live, 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 all right. And he turned around and looked at me like this. <laughs> and I, I said, and he was like, how do you know? I said, because I could see it, nine to the five, six to the rear. And he was like, man, listen, we stood there and had a conversation for quite some time with my kids. This is an older white man. I had no business talking to this man. We have nothing in common as far as me knowing him or him knowing me. It's just I'm able to pick up, right? And they're able to pick up as well with me when I'm out in public as well. So it's good when vets link up. We share similar paths and similar stories and similar experiences and all these things. So big up to them, each and every one of them. I big up everybody uh, every morning, the law enforcement officials, the essential workers out there in the medical field, the nurses, the doctors, the CNAs, you know, assistant uh, therapists, all these people. Shout out to the veterans as well. All right. And those on active duty right now. I know what it feels like to be away from home. Multiple holidays. All holidays pass, you in a sandbox. All holidays pass for years. You, you haven't been home yet for not one of these holidays. Everybody else is home. We barbecuing today. We doing this today. You got a mission to run sometime soon that you might not make it back home from. And they're telling you, OPSEC, and don't tell your family this, and we're going to lock off our communications for the next 30 days, blah, blah, blah. We know what that feels like. All right? Now, here we are this morning. I got two interesting stories this morning. Somebody said yesterday, SoFlo, I enjoy your channel, but you spend too much time talking about what you're going to talk about instead of just getting right to it. Hear me out. I do what I do the way how I do what I do, okay? And there are people that don't mind me doing the way how I do it. I can't please everybody. First of all, that person isn't even a subscriber to the channel. Um, and I told the person that. I said, look at you. You're like someone that comes by every now and then. Imagine me switching up everything that I do to please you. I please the people that ride with me, the people that pay me, because this is how they pay me, by riding with me. I can't please everybody, and it's a talk show. We have to go through stuff talking. We can't just jump in at a thing. This is not a commercial. This, this is not I have 60 seconds to finish everything. 
So it's not that kind of format. I'm sorry you don't have the time to sit and watch and listen and engage. And that's why I tell you to get your membership because these people in the comment section right here, they cut up on their own. They be having their own conversation. Sometimes I'm talking or I'm reading material and I look over there and there's a whole different conversation going on. So if you want some people to talk to, vibe with early in the morning, that's on some upful vibrations, joy and upliftment and all these other things, get your membership and get in that comment section right there. And you probably wouldn't mind so much that I take some time to get to the material, right? All right. All love, same way. Can you still stop by? Now, this morning, we're going to talk about Donnelly. I stopped by the chat room. Shout out to Seymour Bennett. Shout out to um, quite a few people in the chat. The chat room is very festive. Those who are in it, they know that. The chat room is live. All kinds of stuff are going in there. Uh, material is being posted on a rapid pace to that chat room, and conversations are being had around them. One of the conversations was, was Donnelly cremated? Was she cremated? And it wasn't just was she cremated. There was a layout map of the location of, location of, and distance between. And you notice I said location of, location of. We're going to talk about what location of to what and distance between what and what in a minute. So... One of the things we're going to talk about this morning is was Donnelly Donaldson cremated already? And that's the reason they can't find her. And another one is this story I was going to cover already, but a couple of people hit me up in my, I went through my mail this morning ordering people's t-shirts and stuff and ran into people asking me, so Flo, you have to talk about this one, which I was going to already. So since so many people said, talk about it, I'm going to talk about it here on Morning Thoughts. My son with schizophrenia was unlawfully deported to Jamaica. I think that's a very interesting story. It's pretty lengthy and very detailed. But let me say this. The UK is not playing with us. The US is not playing with us. You see, the US, right, does way more deportation flights than the UK. And here's the thing. When the U.S. does the deportation flights, they don't make announcements. The flights them just come in, right? Jamaica, Jamaica just receive them. The U.S. is like, hey, you right next door. Listen, clean shop, clean out house. Send, send, send. And I've heard that the flights come on a rapid basis. Monthly, these flights are coming in. So the U.K. may seem like they're doing a lot of deportation, especially to the Caribbean diaspora, more like somebody said, stop using the word diaspora. Lord, we can't please everybody. Anyhow, the, the UK might be looking like they're doing a lot, but that's because there are a lot of people in the UK that are protesting. Not too many people in the US are protesting these deportations. You get caught in the US, you go, to, um, you go through the ICE process, you get deported, that's it. There's no big line of people out here that's saying stop the deportation flights, don't deport the people. In the U.S., no one cares. You're getting deported, you're getting deported. You better have some good money, family backing, and a find a good um, immigration lawyer. Or more than likely, you'll be sitting back where you were trying to run from in the first place. I just saw it go. In the U.K., it's kind of different. These people mobilize. These people get out there. These people, pro I've seen the protests. I've seen the stop the charter flights protests. They are huge, okay? And they are filled with some of everybody in it. You have white people, you have black people, you have some of everybody in it. It's something that's out there protesting. Anyways, when I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again before I go into this story, I don't think it's fair. I think this is a tool that they use to destabilize certain places for instance there's no reason that someone who left at two three four five six eight seven them kind of age they eight nine years old and you're sending them back in their 30s and 40s and they had never been from the day their parents or their people took them and took them to wherever over to your land they have never been back they didn't even come back for a vacation they know nothing of, let's be specific, Jamaica. 
They know nothing about Jamaica. They don't know about the culture anymore. Whatever little they know about the culture comes from whatever they're soaking up overseas, and that's not the raw culture. They don't know them ears, them foot not the panic grung. Them don't know how the place run. You understand? They are detached. So sending these people back for one, I think it's cruel and unusual punishment because usually most of these people already were punished for what they did. You sent me to prison. I did my time. I came out. Now you're deporting me. That's another punishment on top of, that's like sending me to prison, doing my time. And then when I get out, you put me back in to do the same time all over again, or even worse. That makes no sense. And also, when they do this type of stuff to people, none of these people are okay when they reach Jamaica. They are a burden to the society there. A lot of things happen. People end up, I've seen one girl who, by the way, she was very manny, like she act like a man. You know, some, some men act effeminate and some women act very masculine. She was one of the masculine women. And she was very blunt about it. She was like... She had her hat like this and everything. Y'all might have seen that little documentary. She was like, yo, tell you the truth, you know, uh, enough people have to come down and come bow out, you know, for surviving. You know, that me I try to tell you, you know, yeah, yeah, all who never gay before, I forget, you know, them kind of thing they are going and that me I tell you about, you see it. And I'm like, look at the, the, the human condition. Enough people who never gay before, I forget, you know, for survive. Yeah, because when them land, them don't have nowhere to go, you know what I mean? Them just stuck out there, so somebody will come tell us, say, yo, you don't have nowhere to go, we have a place where you can sleep, you know, and you can shower and get a change of clothes and thing, and then people will start, like, take care of you and bring you in at them fall and thing, and what are you going to say? You want to step on the street, or you want somewhere um, safe and warm to sleep and some food to eat and them thing there? So all who never gay before turn gay. Then these girls come turn prostitute and all these other kind of things, and the man them, enough of them end up in gang activities, right? Because they have to survive. The gangs are there waiting. I did not know that Jamaica had so many gangs. Hundreds of gangs, literally hundreds of gangs in Jamaica, active. In little, little Jamaica. So they're waiting and they're like, yo, come here. You have nobody up? No. You look like you're dust, like them dust dip you, them just dip you. Yeah, so then I have nowhere to go. No, come in, man. Come in, we'll set you up. If you follow the um one of these cases that recently was in court, gang case, you would hear one of the testimonies from one of the so-called witnesses who said that that's exactly how they recruited one of the youth, them, and then they ended up killing him because when he figured out what was going on, like, yeah, we never give you all this stuff for free. Yeah, you have to go put in work now. What do you mean put in work? Murder people, we have somebody for you to kill right now. I'm like, no, nah, I can't do that. So they killed him. And that was from their testimony. I wasn't there, me don't know. It's an alleged from a testimony, but it's just giving you an insight into what they face when them land upon the ground. There is no big system put in place in Jamaica. Word out there is that the Jamaican government collects a certain amount of money for each person deported from a foreign country. That money is supposed to be put together and used to establish a system in the country that will reintegrate these people back into that society. However, that money they got to pocket and them go to the streets. That's just how it works. That money goes to pocket. Them come in off the plane, process through, go to the streets. They have organizations in Jamaica, or one or two organizations, I believe, that are set up a uh, void of the government support that are set up to help people to transition back. But they are very small and can only do so much. I spoke about this before, and I said that a big old complex, because the amount of deportees that Jamaica get, a big old complex. You see, like how them have a big prison complex, they need to have one of these big secured buildings where when you're deported you are processed through here once you're processed through here you don't just leave the same jamaican people them hey boy i lock up here tell the people them about lock up the people them yo freedom we say you can't say you know mean jamaican people no good 
Because the people them already get locked up overseas, them already get deported. I know you talk about build big prison buildings to lock up people you now when them come home. Nah, no, send the people them a road. Me not talk about lock up the people them. I went into painstakingly into details. Listen, there needs to be a building like this, okay? And the people them who are being deported need to be categorized when they come in. Dangerous felons deported back to the island goes here. Classify them as class A. Those who are coming in who only overstayed their time, they were doing well overseas, them just did a look a better life kind of thing, and it didn't work out, them get catch, they classify them as class B, them go over there so they didn't commit no crime, they have no record of no criminal activity, nothing, them get catch, they will be the fastest ones to be released, depending on how long they have been out the country. So for instance, him left last year, January, him get catch and send back already, he knows how the place run. In my Jamaican, true and true, he can go through quicker. Someone who's been out of the country for the last 10, 15 years, granny dead and gone, brother and sister gone afar him, the neighborhood you sending him back to, nobody knows or remembers him there, and these kind of things, he can't just be let go like that. Where's he going to work? How's he going to earn an income to have food, clothes, and shelter, the basics of life? right? There needs to be an integration program within that building. Send, keep Some of them need to be kept in the building for months, right? And, and, and go through classes where they are taught how things go here, how to get a job, who might be hiring, this, that, and the other, and put them on a track to success. You can just have the people that might fly through the airport and go right out into public like that. Man ain't been back in like 20 odd years. And you just send him just right through like that. The last time he was here, he was getting on a plane at nine years old. What do you think he's coming back to do? What do you think he's coming back to do? I can tell you what I'll be coming back to do. I have some good training in my background. I mean, I'll come back, come do nothing good. I would probably be angry as hell, first of all. And I would be very leery, like scared for my life. So now I'm going to operate in a... Uh, survival mode kind of flex. You know what I'm saying? It's killer be killed out here kind of thing. That's what they're setting up the people for. So this kind of complex that I spoke about, this is how I explained it, that it needs to be. People need to be tested. Are you coming in with hepatitis, this, that, and the other, A to Z? Are you coming in HIV positive? Were you on psych meds when you were incarcerated in the UK? or that regulates your behavior are in the U.S. And because when they dip them, they don't dip them and say, here's a year's worth of your meds and you can stay on your meds and we will notify somebody that will monitor you to make sure. No, them sending sick people with no medication. They had them there on meds. Them put them on the plane with them last medication dose that morning. And by the time they reach a Jamaica in the evening, that dose is starting to wear off and they're starting to trip the hell out, okay? So that don't mean nothing good for our country. That does that means nothing good for Jamaica. And if the Jamaican government can understand that this place that I'm talking about is very necessary, we're going to continue to have all the issues we're having now. Let me do this disclaimer real quick because some people, you know, no, operator, be your ignorance. Not every deportee is a criminal. Remember that. Not every deportee is a criminal. This is not the picture that you stroke with one brush all the way through. Not every deportee is a criminal. Matter of fact, it is proven that majority of deportees have no criminal record. They're not criminals. But of course, you do have those that were violent criminals overseas. Man rape, man cut up man, stab up man, shoot up man, and woman, kill woman and all these things. These people come back too. We have to figure out who is who, who's in the right state of mind versus who's not. You're letting go demons on the damn population and the poor suspect, unsuspecting Jamaican citizens, they don't know no better. Half of them out there talk about, well, come home and hi, and God go with you and I hope you. That time Monday, they look upon you like, eh, eh. I got to find a way to survive. You look like food. You look like a victim. I make you a victim. Why? Why? So with that, this story, 
the family of a man with schizophrenia is taking legal action against the home office for allegedly unlawfully deporting him to Jamaica. Now, this brother is ill, right? And his story is real. It's a true story. It just happened. Eric Hall arrived in the UK. See, 10 years old. He arrived in the UK 10 years old. He does have convictions for theft, for drugs, for possession of an offensive weapon. Now, let me say it again. I know some of you are so hardlined that you're like, yeah, you go to people and place, behave yourself. I am like that too. But I'm like that to people who went to other people's place as an adult. You see, if that place raised you, then you're theirs. You're not, Jamaica didn't raise him. He, you're not Jamaican, right? You were only born in Jamaica. Them raise you. Them raise you. So whatever ways you were failed in there or whatever things you got into there, I them for deal with it. Anyhow, he arrived in the UK at 10 years old and he does have convictions for a couple of things, theft, drugs, and possession of an offensive weapon. He's troubled with schizophrenia all his life. So he was easily manipulated, drawn into things. You know how the thing go already, right? And it's not like his family lives in a gated community in where the upper echelons of society live and them can go access all the best care for him and these things. More than likely, they're in a community where, you know, a bad man around there and waste man around the area and these things, and they like to turn people into victims, which is the same thing that happens in Jamaica. People see you and they're like, yeah, I just explain that to you. Yo, you're just rich. You look like I'm just dip you. Come in, man. You good? You have food, you have someone for sleep, you have people who support you. No, no, no. Come on, we have something for you. There's something where them have for you is nothing good. But you're not going to find out now, right? So the Home Office denies relatives' claims that he was sedated before a flight, saying that the deportation was lawful. Of course, the Home Office never says anything opposite. The family is saying he was out of control. He, was, he had to be sedated, and all they did was they drugged him up, put him on the flight, and sent him to Jamaica. Home office is saying, no, nah, we, didn't, we didn't sedate him. We just put him on the flight, and it was lawful. It says the right of the British public are put before those of dangerous criminals. So the home office is saying, if we should let him stay here, what this is saying is, the right of the British public should be put before dangerous criminals. Um, if we let him stay, we're saying that it's the other way around, right? Although he was born in Jamaica, he's 38 years old. That man is almost 40. Him left Jamaica at 10. What? This, is, this, is the, this is exactly what I'm talking about right here, right? He's 38 years old. He moved to the UK with his family in the early 90s, and he was granted his indefinite leave to remain. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia in his early teenage years and his family and his legal team, most of his past criminal behaviors, he has 28 convictions for 55 offenses. He was largely down to his poor, which is largely down to his poor mental health. They believe that he has only ever been a danger to himself not to anybody else, rather than the wider society, and that he continues to be seriously vulnerable. Man, take him and stretch him like elastic and send him yes and carry him this and make him do this and go this and go in another store, they go pick up something there and bring it, come yes and all these things, right? Now, what this is, and all you're witnessing here, is a vulnerable individual that was taken advantage of. Now, this is not made up. This is not his family jumping in last minute and saying, hmm, let's try to think of something that can save him from deportation. I wonder if we say, if he's schizophrenic, then we say, okay, no. No, he was diagnosed schizophrenic from early teenage years. I think 13 or something like that, 14. He was diagnosed schizophrenic from early teenage years. This is no secret, right? And within the community that he lived in, he was manipulated and he was dragged along. So critics of the Home Office policy says Eric's deportation on grounds of his Jamaican citizenship has echoes of the Winrush scandal 
In 2018, many adults, children of post-war Caribbean migrants, despite having lived and worked in the UK for decades, were suddenly told that they no longer had a right to stay there. The scandal led to the government apologizing for home office immigration mistakes against Caribbean immigrants and their subsequent mistreatment. Beverly Johnson, I appreciate you greatly. Thank you. Before he was arrested in early March, Eric had been living in supported housing in East London, and he was being cared for by a mental health community team. And them take him out of that, you know, go put him on plane and send him to Jamaica, deport him, you know. He, before he was deported, before he was um, arrested in early March, he had been living in supported housing in East London and was cared for by a mental health community team. Them not have no mental health community team in Jamaica that's going to care for him. Dog name him supper already. Me can tell you that. His family says that if he was sent a letter by the home office about his deportation, he would not have even understood its significance. Eric was taken to a detention center from there where his lawyer and his family says that his mental state just deteriorated considerably. He repeatedly told them that he had not been served any deportation papers and he did not think that he was about to be flown out of the country. He kept thinking, ah, it's not going to happen. There's no way they're going to fly me out the country. I didn't do nothing. Where am I going? You can't imagine leaving Jamaica at 10 years old and somebody is trying to friggin' send you back. You've you never been back. And somebody is saying, tomorrow you get on the plane and you leave. Where am I going? Why are you putting me on a plane? Where am I going? I'm 30, I'm almost 40 years old. Where am I going? You're going to Jamaica. To Jamaica? For what? A vacation? No, you're going to stay there. Eric's legal team says that they're challenging his deportation, or they were challenging his deportation, but were challenging because they dip him. This is not, oh, we can save him from getting, he's gone. They dipped him, right? So his legal team in the UK is saying that they were challenging his deportation, but they were not sent the key paperwork from the home office, which must be served legally within three days of someone's departure. So again, the home office is accused of all the shady stuff they're always accused of. You know, all they're, all they're concerned about is can we get you on the plane? And once them get you on the plane, can we get this person out the country without any advocate group or any lawyer running in last minute and saying, whoa, stop, stop, stop. Because if they do, then we're going to have to take people off the plane again. Because you know the lawyer them come with something that make the person has to be taken off the plane. So they hope they could shuffle them on the plane quick enough and get them out of there. People are fighting for them. A lot of the times, these deportation flights, we get the message. 75 deportees coming in the first of next month to Jamaica from the UK. By the time that plane land, it's five deportees that are on it. Why? Because the rest of them have family members and friends, close relatives who are rallying around their case and running and getting a proper attorney for come defend the thing and deal with them. And the attorneys are usually able to find something. Well, how long has my client been locked up here? And they're like, well, we've had him here for the past three months. Okay. I've been his attorney for the past two months. I've been trying to get in touch with him. I haven't been able to. Oh, so he was denied the opportunity to sit with his attorney and go to take him off the flight. That's illegal, blah, blah, blah. So if you don't have somebody like that, that's going to do all that for you. Again, you're going to be deported. Immigration lawyer Holly Stowe also says they asked Charity Medical Justice to assess Eric. Their report from the medical justice team concluded that because of his paranoid schizophrenia, which is the worst type, with his paranoid schizophrenia, he should not have even been detained and he was not fit to fly. That's why his family was asking, how else could y'all have gotten him on the plane and gotten him to Jamaica? He has paranoid schizophrenia. He would have been bugging the hell out the whole time. Instead, him sit on the plane 
staring in a one spot, drool upon himself till him reach. Right? The Home Office says that foreign criminals and their legal representatives are served their removal directions in advance of their flying. And again, this is the Home Office. This is how they always try to back themselves up. They're going to go against everything that they say about them, right? Roxon Evans, thank you and welcome. All claims raised are fully considered and determined before deportation, including where applicable via the courts. That's a lie. Eric was put on a plane on the 18th of May of this year. And he was sent to Jamaica on the 18th of May of this year. His relatives in Jamaica now, who are now having to deal with him and to care for him, they have a lot to say also. Eric's a sick boy. I live with him. I know, says Errol Brown. Eric is too unwell to be interviewed. But in a remote farming town in the southwest of Jamaica, we meet his elderly stepfather. Eric is too unwell to be interviewed. I'm casting if you want to interview because I'm going to go through it, right? And he's rambling and doing all the things that paranoid schizophrenic people do when they don't have proper medication and a proper routine set in place for them. So family members are speaking out now. Him just gone to Jamaica to go get madder, worse, what's her up? Eric is too unwell to be interviewed, but in a remote farming town in the southwest of Jamaica, we meet his elderly father. His elderly father is Errol Brown. He talks to us on a hilly main road outside a parade of boarded up shops. He said that Eric is sick. He's a sick boy. I live with him and I know. His hands are shaking before wiping tears from his eyes. He is now caring for Eric full time at his home in St. Elizabeth Parish. But he says that his stepson needs medication and he needs face-to-face -face health support, counseling and that type of stuff, which isn't routinely available in Jamaica. You see, Home Office claim that they look at each case and they, they think about each individual and is he going to be okay? Um, are these things available for him or are we sending him pretty much to his death kind of thing? And we make decisions based on that. I can tell you right now that they don't give a damn. Them not look upon nothing. The only thing they look at is name and whatever number they classify you as and they're trying to get you on that plane as soon as possible. Just the other day, they said, anybody who came to the UK uh, 10 years and below will not be deported regardless of offense. The UK will deal with you there and then. Remember when I did that, I covered that, and we said, yes, that's a good one, but stop. One thing the military taught me is this. If you say it to me, the only way it's guaranteed is when you put it in writing. So I said, yeah. The, the home office is playing games again because that's not in writing. And I guarantee you, later on, they're going to be deporting people. And then when you ask them about it, they can be like, huh? What? When did we say that? Oh, that was only temporary. That wasn't really um, something that we put in place for permanent. And that's exactly what they did. You see? People be like, so Flo, you're profiting. Oh, you know said that did not going to happen. It's not no profit, my friend. It's we know who if once you know who we're the what our storied history with the UK, once with the British, once you know who we're dealing with, then you know what they're capable of, right? And I knew that they were going to do this, and they did. They did. So he's sick. The man said, He live with me, me know him need help. BBC News has been has seen medical documents confirming Eric's paranoid schizophrenia. Now, you know, BBC is not going to throw their name. This is British Broadcasting Corporation. They're not going to throw their name behind this if paperwork ain't in place. 
If family is just running up talking about, yeah, he's paranoid, schizophrenic, and it's illegal, man. Look at the illegal deportation they just did to our fam our vulnerable family member. BBC ain't gonna go behind that. The only way BBC are gonna go behind that is BBC is gonna say, so um, is there a history of this illness? They have to be able to prove that yes, there was. Okay, where is his uh where, what I'm calling it again, where's his diagnosis or his diagnostic papers? Where is, what's the name of his uh, counseling team leader? Where's, what's the name of the, his, his schizo, his therapist? What's the name of his psychiatrist, et cetera, et cetera. Where, where does he go for his, where does he go for help? Where does he go for counseling? Where does he go for blah, blah, blah. They have to have all that in place and they do. They do. Like I said, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia early teenage years, 13, 14. He came to the UK at 10. So you left Jamaica at 10, and by the time you are 13, 11, 12, 13. By the time you're 13, that's two, three years. By the time you are 13, 14, you are diagnosed paranoid schizophrenia. Paranoid schizophrenic. And then almost 40 years old, they're sending you back to Jamaica by yourself. That's crazy. You see what Kaz Robinson says? Listen, all of a sudden, they will lose his paperwork. Yeah, because, and they will. Kaz, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Bro Shaka says, culture shock, maybe. This condition is not, this will only exacerbate or this will only work up whatever it is they're going. I don't know if you've ever been around somebody who suffers from paranoid schizophrenia, but they get into the mind frame where you can be around them and you can be one minute, you can be their friend. And the next minute they could be trying to hurt you because their mind is telling them, that they must stub out the side of your neck and take the devil out tight because if they don't, you're going to kill them and this kind of stuff. It happens all the time, all the time. They're saying that him, he has never harmed anybody. And for that reason, from 13 to 38, he has never harmed anyone else. So they don't believe that he is one of the paranoid schizophrenic people who goes around harming people. If anything, he has been a danger to himself more than anything, but there are paranoid schizophrenic people who have committed murder because they're hearing voices and they don't, they, they've committed murder, they've committed suicide, they've done all kinds of things because they're hearing voices and the voices overshadow whatever it is, whatever normal thinking process is going on in their head, right? They're trying to say, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to. That's why you'll see them like talking to themselves sometimes. I'm, I'm no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to. And you're like, how would a man do? I chat to my chat to himself. He mad, you know? He's wrestling with the voices. You know, his rational thinking voice is trying to outweigh these flood of voices that are saying things to him. And for those who are not in a controlled environment and on medication to control this, they usually lose the battle. They're the ones that you usually see. If they're not violent, them can't stay one place, you know, and them start just walk road and they're mad and them walk road and then dirty and they forget about personal hygiene. So you see them, oh, the boy come back from England and mad out to rotted, yo. Because you know we have a stereotype about deportees in Jamaica, yeah? So when you see them come back, I saw one in Portmore. And everybody that tell me say, yeah, man, a deportee, you know, and get deported from uh, US or England, I think. My boy dress up every day and go out in the middle of the town square. And I remember Auntie Cutie, I said, hey, what, a look, what a good looking young man, too. You know, but he was just there and he turned up there and talked to his sky all day, every day. And when he see anything like playing pass and them something there, and he might have a big conversation with them, you know, and, and, like, he's not on no medication. He's not getting the help that he needs. He's just deteriorating. He is just out there at the mercy of the will of whoever want to take him and do what they want to do with him, they're free to do it, you know? So it's not a better situation they sent him to. 
The man says he's now caring for Eric full-time at his home in St. Elizabeth. But he says that his stepson needs medication and face-to-face -face mental health support, which isn't routinely available in Jamaica. BBC News has seen the medical documents confirming, and this is BBC I'm reading from, BBC News has seen the documents confirming Eric's paranoid schizophrenia, a condition that is also referred or a condition that is also referenced in home office correspondence to him. That means the home office knew of his condition and BBC verified that they saw not only paperwork that says this is what he is and he has been diagnosed since whenever, but that the home office was made aware of his condition. They know about it and they were in communication with him. What did they say to him? Before his removal from the UK, Eric's family says that he had been refusing to take any medication and that on his arrival in Jamaica, it appeared as if he had been heavily drugged. They say that he didn't recognize his stepfather in Jamaica's capital, Kingston, and he had no memory of how he even got there. Now, I don't need to tell us that the flight from the UK to Jamaica is a long rotted flight. So you can imagine when you wake up and get off the plane and you're like, where, where am I? Why, why am I here? What's this? And the people who came to pick you up, who you probably FaceTime with all the time, you don't recognize them. I mean, I know nobody around here. What do you think he's going to do? He's going to bug out. He's going to bug out. Let's be honest. If he wasn't taking his meds, prior to him leaving and they got him to calmly sit on a plane for all them hours. I seen somebody just said 10 hours. I was my last flight I was on got delayed and ended up being a 14 hour flight. But yeah, it's a long, it's a long journey. So I can't imagine completing that journey and then not remembering how I got here. How many end up at Heathrow or Gatwick? I'm just here. There's something wrong. Something is wrong. They drugged him up, you know? And I think his family's claims are absolutely correct. They drugged him up and put him on that flight, man. So BBC has seen the medical documents. Before his removal, he was refusing to take his meds. His family says they had to have drugged him up because he didn't recognize his stepdad when he got to Kingston and he didn't remember how he even got there in the first place. Out of the blue... We heard Eric was in Kingston, says Errol Brown. Nobody notified us ahead that he was coming. Out of the blue, we heard Eric, they are Kingston. Somebody needs to go pick him up. He can't explain to me how he even got here. This is the stepdad talking, you know, that's in Jamaica. He said, out of the blue, we just get a notification and say, Eric, they are Kingston. Somebody needs to go pick him up. When we reach... Eric can't even explain how him reach here. Now y'all tell me if this ain't wickedness. Hmm? When we reach, him can't even explain how him reach here. The youth couldn't say him come on a plane. Yo, you think them people here got any kind of love for us? Yo. He can't even explain how he got here. I have asked him many times. Still can't explain how he got here. I know he was out of it. He would have had to have been sedated or knocked out. He didn't know where he was. And he didn't have a clue who I was. Yo. So the home office rejects the claim that Eric was drugged. Passengers are never sedated on removal flights, and it's wrong to suggest that we did otherwise. This is what it said in its defense statement. Right here, I have a picture of Eric. I have a picture of his stepfather. I have a picture of his mom. I'll show you in a minute. Eric's mother, Polly Brown, who lives and works in London, she decided to take legal action because she says that the home office was aware of her son's complex, long-term medical history. 
Given the severity of his mental health condition, his family says that he is unable to legally represent himself. Mistress Brown is now acting on her son's behalf. Remember, I know he wasn't a minor. He's an adult. So they're treating him like this adult that can handle everything. You should be able to sort out all the legal paperwork, get in there, understand all this stuff we're sending you, read through it, sign what needs to be signed. Yep, we notified you. You're leaving on Friday. Let's go. He doesn't have the mental capacity. He only has his stepfather to look after him in a strange country that he left when he was 10 years old, she says. In her East London flat, surrounded by family photos, photos, her mood momentarily brightens as she shares childhood memories of her son. She said he was very loving. When I used to go to school for his reports, they always said good things about him. She described how he was passionate about art and once painted a picture of his own face, which was displayed in the school reception area. He was also a talented football player for an academy outside of his school. His manager used to call him the gazelle, she says. But not long before, those fun memories vanished and her mind is then thrown back to the present situation she's dealing with. Now, we all know that Jamaica now has become very violent. There are guns everywhere. And there are killings every day, she says. It breaks my heart thinking about it, that he's out there and he might get killed. Deportation flights are used to remove, but well, um, I mean, I hate to break it to you, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Can't go around that one. Can't go around that one there. And he's not a child. He's a big grown man. You know, when Fim had take him in up and him decide to say, I'm going to go road. Hmm. Anything can happen to him. And he will not have the mental wherewithal to say, weigh up a situation and say, okay, this is dangerous for me. I don't need to be here. I need to go back over. So he won't. He'll be walking right into danger. And if there's anywhere you can get, dash way quick. We all know where that is, right? Beautiful country, enough nice vibes, but dangerous at the same time. We all know that Jamaica has become very violent. She said guns everywhere and, you know, it just pains her heart. She's thinking that, damn, the worst of the worst, like my son might get killed there. Deportation flights are used to remove both foreign criminals who have finished UK jail sentences and other foreign nationals who have stayed in the country longer than legally permitted. Between April 20th, between April of 2020 and May of 2022, the Home Office carried out 130 enforced returned charter flights at an average cost of £200,000 per trip. It ain't a money issue. They'll spend £200,000 on one plane flight, and they have carried out 130 of those. Do the max, 130 times 200,000 pounds. And that's only between April of 2020 to May of 2022. Jamaica, she, this report says Jamaica only represents about 1% of the U.S. overall enforced returns since they do more returns for other countries out there in the world who have way more people that are coming into the UK illegally. Romania, Albania, Poland, they claim, and other places. Errol Brown, he fears for Eric's health. He says that care in Jamaica is free for people on the lowest income, which is a good thing, but public sector facilities are often understaffed, unstaffed, with medical shortages and a lack of funding, Errol can't afford to get private help. Stash saying lies. 
What's the lies, Stash? Talk to it. Talk to us, Stash. What's the lies? Pardon me. His stepfather says, I took him to the doctor after he landed here in Jamaica because I was worried about the medication because him don't have none. You, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? They put a paranoid schizophrenia on a plane. And once he lands, that's the first thing whoever come pick you up. Have to. This is why I said it is so important. To, y now y'all see. Now y'all see why I said it's important to establish this building, the center that, that will have them classified in groups and work through. You're coming in paranoid schizophrenic. Been paranoid schizophrenic for years. Been on medication for years. You're coming in paranoid schizophrenic. The first thing your people will have to do is figure out where to get your medication. What kind of medication you need. He needs to be on medication. Imagine if there's no one there for that person. A lot of them, no one is there to pick them up at the airport. And no one is there to say, oh, you're paranoid schizophrenic? You need to come over here. We can go get you some help. Them let out them people that pawn we. Them march right out of the airport on us. See? Naturally, yours says to destabilize Jamaica and to save them money in health care. These deportations aren't done on an individual basis. From you fall into that category, they want to send you back. Fox. Fox. Somebody says straight Bellevue. You know, Bellevue overcrowded enough. I think Bellevue um, is one of those places where people bring them family member and left them there. Like, because they don't want to take care of them. You know, and, and a lot of the families where people with mental health come from are also families that are strapped for cash or also families that financially aren't doing too well themselves and can't really, don't really have the time and resources to take care of this particular family member. I remember they printed an article not too long ago that said people need to come get them relatives because these people have actually taken up residency there and have been there for years. So it's supposed to be a revolving door. You get sick, you go into a manic phase, you go into Bellevue, you get proper care and counseling, medicated, whatever, and then you come back out and somebody else who is ill goes in. It has turned into an apartment building. People just turn there. And when they're calling relatives, yo, we're ready to release your, your brother or your cousin or your daddy or whoever. Nobody now answer phone. And ain't nobody coming to get them, which is crazy. We also have hospitals in Jamaica that are like that. Hospital. Anyhow, he said, I took him to the doctor after he landed because I was worried about his medication. But our doctor out here, them don't deal with these kind of things. So him care, I'm going to a regular doctor. And the regular doctor is like, this is not my line of expertise. I wouldn't know what to, what to um, prescribe him. You know, in the UK, the family has developed a close relationship with their local MP who is now challenging the government. Janet Davey raised a question in Parliament on the day Eric was deported and supports all of the family's claims. Malani. So in his younger days, he had been groomed. This is this is his story, right? And this is what, uh, in the UK, the family had developed a close relationship with their local MP, who is now challenging the government, Janet Davey. Janet Davey raised a question in the parliament on the day that Eric was deported and supports all of the family's claims. She went and did her research and found all their claims to be true. There's no way he could have flown to Jamaica um, and not bug out because he would have bugged out and they did sedate him and that also he has been schizophrenic, paranoid schizophrenic 
since he was early teenagers and all this other stuff. The local MP. I'm wondering why they didn't get all this help before and support before he got deported. Because you see, once you are deported, it's very hard to get undeported. In all my years, I've seen probably about two or three persons who were deported that got called back. One was from the UK and he was from the, um, he, he wasn't from the Windrush. He was a product of Windrush generation family um, parents, both parents. And he got deported to Jamaica and he spent a couple of years in Jamaica. And then he got sent back to the UK because the UK admitted to deporting him unlawfully. When he got back to the UK, his flat was gone. His um, Everything he worked for was no longer there. He had to start all over again. And he's in the UK complaining now that there isn't even help for him to start back over. So it's like they wiped out my life, sent me to Jamaica the whole time I'm kicking and screaming, saying this is not okay. And eventually it proves that it's not okay. Now they bring me back and just drop me here. Yes, I'm thankful to be back because I have a family here that's tight and a support system, but I'm going to have to work my way up again to get back everything I had before. You know, and he talked about his time in Jamaica and how he had no support out there, no living family members out there, nothing like that. But thank God for his family in the UK who really cared for him. He was able to hold out even when he felt like he was losing his mind and losing his self. In losing hope, he was able to hold out and thank God things work out for him where he got back there. It's possible. It's possible. But I wish he had gotten this help before deportation because now it's going to be hard. And there was one, I believe, a Navy. Is it a Navy? He served in some part of the U.S. military. He was deported and this was from the U.S. And I just came across his case a couple of days ago where it says that he was taken back into the U.S. So it happens, but not too often. You know, I'm hoping in this case, it, they overturn this and he's able to get back to the U.K. and get real help. In his younger days, he had been groomed. He had been coerced into getting involved into gang activities and criminal activities. And he is severely unwell. This is the MP. That's saying this. She described Eric's criminal activity as low level and says that he has been demonized and shipped off to another country. Eric Hall's experience in Jamaica isn't an isolated case. The Home Office says it helps fund charitable organizations in Jamaica so deportees can reintegrate back into society. But Eric's family says that he hasn't been offered any ongoing support. Upon arrival in Jamaica, we were only able to locate one such charity. They told us that they received funding from the home office, but they did not want to be interviewed. I will bet you money. It's the same one that I know about. I will bet you money also that, mm, I have to be careful how I say this, that there's no, you know, I'm not careful about none. I will, I'll bet you money that there's no accountability of how these funds that are allocated from the home office is actually used there in Jamaica for run this. Party shop, board house, clap up, do the minimum, pocket the rest. Is a business. Remember, I know that's where I come from. You know, me know, me know the thing running up. So I'm not talking from no outside looking in kind of thing. Eric Hall's experience in Jamaica isn't an isolated case. We've spoken to six men, other men, all with criminal convictions who were flown from the UK and now live on different parts of the island, and they all say that they had an un they had no ongoing help. And they have been unable to find secure employment, training, or housing. So they're bunks about from here to there. Nowhere to work. Them can't find employment. And there is nobody or anything supporting them from the day they landed until now. And they're in similar cases. 
left Jamaica very young, got deported back, grown men, heading into their 40s, some of them in their 50s. After you left at like 9 and 10 and 7. They say that deportees like them are stigmatized and they worry for their safety. Some have no choice but to live with elderly relatives while others struggle to survive on the streets of downtown Kingston where shootings and gang crimes are rife. Jamaica's Minister of Legal and Constitutional Rights, Marlene Malahu Forte, says that she takes serious issue with the UK's deportation policy of sending those who have little to no ties to the island and have been socialized in the British culture. She says that there is a disregard or insufficient regard for matters of family ties. It's mostly tantamount to the old method of punishment of transportation. In a statement, the Home Office said that we are clear that foreign criminals should be deported from the UK wherever it is legal and practical to do. Any foreign national that is convicted of a crime and given a prison sentence is considered for deportation at the earliest opportunity. But Eric Hall's lawyer says that he deserves to continue living in the UK and they have filed a claim of unlawful detention and unlawful deportation against the Home Office. Eric's human rights have been breached. It's just wrong and completely unfair, says Holly Stowe. There's a sense of desperation here from the Home Office to get people on a flight who shouldn't actually be on a flight and should not be detained in the first place. The Home Office says that it remains committed to removing foreign nationals with no rights to be in the UK. But Polly Brown hopes and prays that her son will return to the UK one day. Meanwhile, in Jamaica, Errol Brown says that he will continue to care for Eric as best as he can while he is able to. But he warns that time is against them. There's no future at all here for him. He can't survive here on his own. And Mr. Errol Brown is elderly. So when them elderly people there tell us, uh, you know, time is limited. I remember before my grandmother passed, she said, me don't have much longer left, you know. This time nothing was wrong with grandma, you know. She just said, me don't have much longer left, you know, so make sure you know, come see me as often as possible. And Mr. Grandma, you're going to live till, you're, you're going to live for a long, long time. She said, <laughs> You know, her beautiful smile. She was like, <laughs> no, baby, so you think. It's so you think. But grandma knows. And I was like, what the, what's she trying to tell me? Fast forward, boom. One leg get take off. Fast forward, look a bit more, boom. Funeral time. I'm like, yo, this lady, like, they, they know. They know. I'm feeling it coming. Right? They feel it coming. So... He's letting them know that, listen, this, this youth can't survive here on his own. And I'm the only person that he has here. So once anything happened to me, it's a wrap for him. He is going to be on his own. So here's Eric. Well, this is a younger picture of Eric. Yes. That's a younger picture of him. They have him right where they want him. They wanted him out of the UK. And they have him right where they want him. Here is his, this is the man, Mr. Brown, that is taking care of him, his stepfather, that's taking care of him in Jamaica. And he's telling them that he is elderly himself. And we're pressed for time right now because if anything happened to me, Eric is on his own. There's nobody else here that's going to take care of him. How is he going to survive? And this is pretty much how some people end up walking the streets, you know, because, and that's his mom. And that's his mom who's telling the story and fighting to get her son back into the UK. See? So put a face to the story is why I showed the faces. It's it's sad. It's sad. The, the I said all I had to say from before I even went into the story. 
So I mean, I have nothing more to say other than there is no empathy. These people don't give two dams about us, but we seem to have this kind of like we forget. We forget so easily, you know. Soji eight one nine says her face looks so familiar. You know what, Soji? I thought the same thing, but you know, enough how we look alike, you know. Enough how we look alike. But I thought the same thing when I saw her. I said she looked very familiar. I wonder if a Clarendon she come from, but it wasn't. So anyhow, then the care about we. My wish is that Eric gets sent back to the UK because honestly, if Mr. Brown kicks the bucket or becomes gravely ill, first of all, Eric can't even help him. He can't even take care of him. They can't even switch the roles. It's not like you go home and you're like, all right, so them fling me out of England. So I forgot make life do you so here, man. So me and Mr. Brown alone there, we're gonna go and bunk it still. You know, and then Mr. Brown is up in age. So if him get elderly, if him get ill, I can, you know, take care of him and out of appreciation for having some place to stay on him. It's not gonna work like that. And the man alone I take care of the youth. And if the youth, if anything happened to that man, that youth is on his own. Period. I street him gone. Soji says, like I seen her in South London. That's where she lives, Soji. She lives in South London. So it's probably, you probably have seen her. Sad as Ross. But I'm making you all aware of this. I don't know what we can do as a people to... I don't know. I, I don't know where to start. I don't know where to start. I think, I hate to say this, but it has to be said. I think the Jamaican government itself needs to step into cases like these and be like, you can't send him here. You know, not just send everybody come. You, they have to step in at some point and be like, you can't send that person here. Look at, are you guys really, the Jamaican government needs to, really say to the British government, <laughs> yeah, right, right. That They fear sanctions. They fear somebody not talking to them anymore. You know, the relationship souring. Other monies that they might be getting might dry up and all these things. So they just go with the flow and everybody get flinging. But come on, man. Somebody needs to step in and be like, hey, I mean, we'll take most of who you send. But are you looking at these people case by case? Because that you here, of, uh, send with 10 more, man. Clean out your prison and send them home. But not that right there. They just let everybody come. And they hush and don't say a word. They know damn well that you come into Jamaica to suffer. Yes, Jane Ander, pretty please. They know damn well that youth is coming to Jamaica to suffer, but them not care because enough of it done there suffer already. So what is one more suffering? It's sad. It's sad. Let me close this segment by saying this. I wish all the best for him. I'm going to look up and see what we can do. Maybe we can write a letter, sign a petition, do something. But And I, I, I'm, I, I'm asking you guys out there watching to do the same. So say tomorrow morning when we meet up, say so follow. On the Eric thing, we can actually sign a petition over here. Here is the petition. Forward it to me. Or we can actually write to this person or that person. I'm going to look up. I have a bunch of things to do today, but I'm going to try to squeeze it in there somewhere. And I'm asking anybody out there who get like a free time out there, busy schedule to do the same. Remember this. The world is different, my friend. We're not boots on the ground anymore. We don't have to be. A lot of stuff is happening online. Politicians have recognized this. They they use this medium to win elections. You understand? So we can also use the same medium to affect change. And it's very possible. So let's link up together and see what we can do. Because this can't, this can't go on. That youth then need to go back to England. He don't have no place in Jamaica. And it's not a good look for him. He's not going to be okay there. He's not okay now. And he's not going to be okay further on down. Right? All right. With that said, my heart goes out, man. But with that said, the last part of this morning's get together, we're going to talk about Donna Lee. We have to continue to say her name because, like I said before, 
They're going to sweep this under the rug. And when they sweep it under the rug, this is going to be it. No justice, no body, no nothing. And don't mind shop, you're here down the road. Now Maitland out on bail. And that's it. You know, when they when they when when the attorney came up with his two witnesses that he said saw Donnelly leave, I immediately said, <laughs> bullshit. Stop lying. But isn't that perjury? No, Soji, him not get bail yet. The judge, he's going before the judge on the 22nd. Today is the, today is the 16th. I have a VA appointment on the 22nd. He's going to, he's, his lawyer has said publicly that he is going to go for bail on the 22nd. They asked the attorney, what might there be existing as in evidence or anything that the prosecution has or investigators have that the judge has seen that would cause the judge to deny him bail. And the attorney says, um, you know, I don't know. I don't want to talk about that right now. We'll go to court first and then we'll see. And then we will discuss why she denied bail. If in fact bail is denied, but, we feel like them feel like they're gonna get bail. I don't feel like they should get bail. I don't feel like they're going to get bail, but let's see how it goes. If they get bail, then you already know what time it is. Everything popped down from this one. Right? So I'm over in the chat room. Shout out to the chat room family. I'm over in the chat room. Sometimes I just go in there, I don't say nothing. I just see the conversation on them and I laugh. The chat room is very festive. Shout out to the people who keep the chat room this way. The chat room is very festive and a whole lot of posts are put up in that chat room on a daily basis. I don't know why I keep going to. So I'm in the chat room and the conversation was brought up. Not only was the conversation brought up, but they had a map, a spread of where this funeral home was located and also, these are questions. We're thinking outside the box. When I say say her name every day, talk about her every day so she does not just disappear and people go, okay, it's quiet now. We can do what we want to do and everybody get away. We have to talk about everything. All the supposes and the possibilities and all them, something that's all. I'm in the chat room and somebody said, I'm, I'm, let me find the chat room. Okay, boom, here we are. In the chat room, uh, somebody said um, the 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 evidence might be right before our eyes, my friend, and we don't even know it. Somebody else said the person they did some research, and the person that owns the funeral home has the same last name as the female cop that has the baby for Noel Maitland. So don't know if this is in fact factual, like they might be related or not, but somebody needs to look into that. And when they said that, I thought, damn, y'all be working. Y'all be working. The person who owns the funeral home has the same last name as the baby mother, the female cop, the constable, that has the baby. Who says she don't have nothing to do with the case and she not talk. She's not telling nothing her. That's a little suspicious. Then they gave a spread map. Distance between his apartment and the funeral home. I'm talking about which is owned by Mr. Smith. His baby mother's last name is Smith also. And he was arrested less than 10 minutes from that funeral home. Coincidence? That had me thinking. In the chat room, right there. The funeral home owner is Smith. Her name is Smith. The distance between their home and the funeral home and he, where he was arrested, 10 minutes from the funeral home, he was arrested. 
is that a coincidence? And they left a map. And the map shows like the distance from, you know, like the distance from the, the funeral home to his home and where he was arrested and that. And I thought, wow. But you know, this was said before. If you go back and listen to the other videos that we did on this, earlier in this, this was a rumor. And I said it was a rumor. And I'm still saying, I don't know nothing about that. We haven't had any solid proof about that. But we're discussing this like family around the table. Because them said them look over the dump and them dig it up and everything, them the fine art. They didn't find any signs of her being over there and all that, even though we think it wasn't searched properly. However, some people have said Clarendon, yes, we did see him down there on the car, down there in that time. So maybe I dumb this so them, them got dash our way. And then another theory is that she was cremated because he has connections to some funeral home. Hmm. If she's cremated, don't look for no findings. That's it. Vicky Victory says, is the funeral home our, uh, owner arrested? No. Why would the funeral home owner be arrested? The funeral home owner might need to be investigated to find out what's their relationship. Like, how long have you known Noel? What's your relationship to him or to his baby mother? Uh, they might need to, the, the investigators might need to figure out. See, I'm still, I'm still, I want this to go to court and all the details come out because I have questions. I'm still asking about her cell phone. I'm still asking about the couch and the content of the couch. What was in the couch? I don't think, okay, so if there was blood on the couch, it's too easy to clean that in the apartment yourself. You wouldn't call a big truck to come through that over balcony and move one whole big, knowing that you're, you're, you're under surveillance and move one whole couch. So what was in the couch? That's my question. And where did it go? Was there ever any visits to that, to any funeral home? Not just that one. Was there ever any visits to any funeral home around that time by Noel Maitland or anybody else that was close to him that went back and forth between that apartment and wherever else. Those are questions that need to be asked and need to be answered. Truck driver must have seen something. All of them need to get squeezed till them start talk. They should have searched his phone records from top to bottom. Yes, and fear our phone. Her phone is going to tell a lot. Remember, you know, prosecution can't just give us everything right now. We out a street. They won't just give us everything right now. But when trial starts is when we will hear everything. And here's the, th here's the thing. They're known for doing this. They're known for giving bail and then trial date set for two years from now. So we'll be sitting here saying the same stuff for the next two years. Where is her phone? Were they able to track her phone? Did he make a visit to the funeral home? Did that couch go to the funeral home? Where did that couch end up? In whose possession? Do they have the couch? What did they find in the couch? You know, we have so many questions that need to be answered, and we might never know the answer to those until they go to court. Give you an example. Beachy Stout. Beachy Stout is still... Do you hear anything about his case? No. Nothing about Beachy Stout case, but the person who alleged that he was hired to do the killing of Tanya, but him couldn't do it because him did too close to her, but him got somebody else to do it and watched him as he did it to make sure it was done. Watch this. The person who testified that 
got them time and is serving their time. The person who he testified on that he actually did it, he got released on bail. You hear what I just said? This is the macabre kind of stuff they go on with. Let me say that for you again. It's alleged that this man wanted to get rid of his wife, right? Because she'd have given bun and all these things and him tilly wheeling her work properly and she young and him way older and all these something. So sugar bother him or whatever. So anyhow, he got somebody to take her out. The person testified to the judge that I couldn't do it. Kamiya, she did too close. We were too cool with each other. The man even said, matter of fact, you see a push part them finer. The only reason why she turned and go up there is because she did a drive. And me tell her, I said, turn and go up yourself. And it did dark up there. And the only reason she turned and go up there because she trusts me. So I couldn't do it. But I get the next youth for do it. The man describing details how him, them wrap her up. You know when you're sitting in the car driving and your head rest is up, him saying wrap him hand round our head, round our neck, pull her to the head, pin her to the headrest, and stab out our chest up. And him sit there and watch him do it. When him done testify that that's what happened, him get in prison time for testifying. The person who him said, him make do it, do the stabbing, Got out on bail. Wanna explain to me how these things work? That's why I keep telling y'all that we're dealing with a funny ass system. Yes, yes, wanna never know that. You're dealing with a funny ass system and you don't know what they're gonna come up with next. And it's been two years. Beachy there was part him there. We don't hear nothing. If the person who you Hired to do the killing, confess, and is doing time already. Why is it taking two years to get to your case now? If you go try you who are the mastermind of that. Not true? Shouldn't we be wrapping up everything at once? But then we want to leave it and leave it and leave it so we forget and don't know nothing about it no more. So five years down the road, we're like, yo, you remember the rich man from Portland when it, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But same thing they would try to do in this case. Yo, you remember the girl, um, Donna Lee, when they get, go missing? Who? The girl, Donna, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what they're trying to do. So y'all better keep talking about this girl because them people here, them people here, this is how they operate to this day. Somebody needs to explain to me how that happened. Somebody says, Beachy Stout out on bail. No, his bail was denied. His bail was denied two times. Might be wrong, maybe even three times. But I know of two, his bail was denied. See? And, uh, but with that, there is no trial. There is no nothing. We're not hearing anything. He hasn't been sentenced. Nothing to come out in a court other than the persons who he allegedly used to do it fully confessed. Matter of fact, let me tell you how it happened. Because Meme did want to do it. Him give special instruction how him want it done. Mr. Shooter him said, no, want her feel pain, tab her up. Vicky Victory says, you know how many cases in Jamaica in waiting? On to be closed? No, man. Yeah, and there's no reason for it other than deception. There's no And, and the common practice that they do is, for instance, all that the man they know, we stab up the girl, and um, according to the, the person who said, I was the one ordered to do it, and get paid for do it, but me make him do it, because me and she, me and Tanya did too close, and couldn't do it. it. What do you think could happen here? Him come a road, and make sure, say, everybody else under pressure out there. Right? Because he, he killed already, right? And he's proven to be able to be that vicious. 
So I'm going to come around and silence all witnesses. And beat your case, go on, go on, go on. Two years, three years. By the time it reached front of the judge, time to settle this now. Yes, okay, so we're going to have to call so-and-so forward with all them fly out. Okay, let's go for the other one. We're going to have to call Mr. Benjamin. Oh, him dead. Pardon me? Oh, he, 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 he died in a shootout. He, he was shot on McGarvey Lane in 2022. Okay, all right, let's go for the other one then, Mr. Oh, we can't locate him. Okay, all right, so there's nobody. Um, hey, let's fling out this case. God, we don't have nothing. That's that's how it goes. That's I have never seen a uh, Jamaica alone missing this happen. Jamaica alone missing this happen. But may I tell I'm showing y'all proper examples of how it operates and how they get down. See, this girl could very well have been cremated. If Noel has links to a crematory, to a funeral home, I used to do a video the other day. Let me close out today like this. I used to do a video the other day, and it was meant to be funny, but the sense in it. All right, so he wrapped a person in a bag. I don't know if you can see it on IG, on the reels. And wrap a person in a bag, like a crocus bag, right? Body in a bag. So I'm fandom random people. Fandom random people and them say, yo, um, how much are you charging for camera me go at so-and-so? You know, and they were like, one one taxi driver was like, give my price. And he was like, all right, come, but we have to move fast. Help me put this in the trunk. So while they're going to help to put the thing in the trunk, the person start move, Right? I watch that something there over and over. Not one person said, uh, actually, lie. One person said, yo, move from us. Yo, me not in a this, you know. Take this out of my car, my gun, but me not in a way you're in a bad man and drive off. Everybody else, once the bag wiggle, and them say, yo, wait there. Are somebody having us up? Yeah, yeah, me not in your business, you know. But me, I charge you an extra 20. Extra 20,000, something like that. And I was like, look at all these people that are willing to participate and then willing to say, me never say nothing. Me no know what happened. He thought he was making a funny video. But for me, this was more like a social experiment that actually showed possibilities of what have happened before and what could happen. But just a one person alone. Say, yo, me not in, once the bag wiggle, him put it down and he was like, yo, me not in this, you know, me not in a way you in a bad man, jumping and carrying him and he was trying to offer him more money. He was like, no, I'm good, me gone and left. One. Everybody else tried to negotiate a price higher for drop him go which part him one go with the body in the trunk and don't tell me nothing else. You see, Tokata Jai Empress. All right. With that said, we're going to leave it right here this morning. Big up to each and everybody tuning in. Manners and respect to each and every one of you. I appreciate you greatly. Let's keep her name alive and let's keep hope alive for at least her being found. Right? So again, her family can give her a dignified burial. And to the youth who is deported with the paranoid schizophrenia, if you could source some kind of information in a little five minutes of break today or something we'll come back and meet right here tomorrow morning again where we can say okay so flow this is what we can do we can sign a petition or we can reach out to something at gmail or dot com or something all right have a wonderful day stay blessed this ain't no rehearsal one life live up i'm out peace munchie